What's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I am your host, Nick Riccada of Riccada Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. If you're ever in the state of Minnesota, you have legal questions or need some help, please look me up. I'll see what I can do. Um, well, guys, it has been, uh, it's been a bit since I've been able to just like sit down and record a video because I have been on vacation a lot lately um, and attempts to get live streams off and stuff like that have been thwarted by hotel internets, by sicknesses, by travel, but no more, no longer. I am at home and it is time to get into it. So today um, we have South Dakota versus Wayfair Inc. This is the start of the, uh, or the first video, I suppose, is how we'll word it, of the 2018 Supreme Court series, um, where we're going to talk about some major, major Supreme Court decisions, uh, the type of stuff that will be taught in law, school, law schools uh, in the years to come, the type of stuff that changes major rules, uh, big, big stuff, big, big cases. Huge cases, really tremendous. I'm going to adjust that video a little bit. Um, all right, so South Dakota versus Wayfair Inc. is a case I do not like. I don't like this ruling at all. This is the ruling that internet retailers must now collect, or well, more appropriately, let's, uh, let's be clear. A state can force an online retailer with no physical presence in the state to collect sales taxes and remit those sales taxes to the state. Okay? That's the ruling. I think it's a really, really bad ruling. It overturned 50 years of precedent. It reinforces the Dormant Commerce Clause, which is the worst, 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 worst thing that the court has ever done with the Commerce Clause is the Dormant Commerce Clause, uh, which is just absolute trash. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go, but it's a, this is a bad decision, guys. It's problematic for, uh, smaller retailers. It's not a problem for big retailers. It shouldn't be decided in the way it is. Uh, it takes Congress's authority away completely. The courts just take it, even though they have no right or reason to do so all around. This is a bad decision, but we're going to go through it. And it's not very long, so I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to also go through Chief Justice Roberts' dissent. This was a 5-4 case. Roberts uh, is, is joined by Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. So that means that Ginsburg voted with the conservatives. Roberts voted with the liberals. If you haven't heard me rant about this, you got to understand that there aren't conservative and liberal lines in the court there are judicial perspectives in the court. Roberts does not like the Dormant Commerce Clause. That's part of his judicial perspective. You can read it in the Obamacare decision, which they tried to use the Dormant Commerce Clause as justification, and Roberts explicitly wrote that out, and he actually decided it under the Tax and Spend Clause, which I hate him for <laughs> just a little bit, but... Uh, he did not. He did not apply the dormant commerce clause. He more correctly, he chose not to expand the dormant Cl commerce clause to do that. Dormant commerce clause, of course, uh, famously is applied in Wickard v. Filburn, one of the one of the dark decisions of our Supreme Court, where the court decided that uh, Congress could regulate the amount of wheat, the amount of wheat that you grew for your own personal use. Uh, because you, it could be sold or, more appropriately, because you wouldn't buy someone else's wheat because you grew your own, so Congress has the right to regulate you. Terrible decision, still stands to this day. Establish the Dormant Commerce Clause, and the Dormant Commerce Clause is crap. So, without further ado, tonight I will be drinking Kirin Whiskey. This is from Japan, uh, as you can tell by the kanji on the uh, logo, label there. Uh, this was from Jacob Ceresia. Again, thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoy this stuff. It's also 
packs a little bit of kick. It is 100 proof whiskey, not the 80 proof normal stuff. So, and I'm also drinking out of a chunk of the earth made into a glass. Mmm. <laughs> That's my whiskey review. Mmm. All right. Let's get into this, guys. So, good news is I'm going to skip the first seven pages of this. We'll start on page eight. This is where the actual opinion starts. Well, right at the bottom of seven here. And uh, I'm not going to read the syllabus. Um, here is the opinion. This is from Justice Kennedy. And at true to form, if you haven't seen me do one of these uh, decision videos, I am going to read it. And I'm going to try and read it really quickly. And what I'm going to also do is explain any sort of uh, maybe things that I find might be confu confusing or might lead me into a rant. So here we go. Justice Kennedy's opinion. When a consumer purchases goods or services, the consumer sta uh, state often imposes a sales tax. This case requires the court to determine when an out-of-state seller can be required to collect and remit that tax. All concede that taxing the sale in question here is lawful. The question is whether the out-of-state seller can be held responsible for its payment, and this turns on a proper interpretation of the Commerce Clause, U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. Let me stop them there. I do not concede that this is a lawful collection of a tax. A state should not be able to tax an out-of-state transaction. Period. 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 It shouldn't be allowed to do it. Why do they? They don't have anything to do with that transaction. The other state can tax it all they want. That makes sense. The sale happens in the other state. Tax the heck out of it. But me purchasing something in a different state should not be taxed by my state. Now listen to the one dummy out there who thinks I don't know this. Yes, I know we are taxed in that way. And I know we have been for a while, even though no one does it. I know that exists, okay? So you don't have to send me a bunch of uh, private messages telling me that this is how it happens. I know. The point is that it shouldn't be this way, and it was determined to be this way by old decisions from the Supreme Court. So my argument is still the nexus of the sale is where the tax should occur. The nexus of the sale is where the retailer or the goods are situated. So. If I'm buying something from someone in Illinois, I should pay Illinois tax, not Minnesota tax, because I can't bring that idiot into court in Minnesota. There's no private or no uh, public services from Minnesota being offered to the Illinois salesperson. Nothing Minnesota does helps with that transaction. And before you whine at me about the internet that I use, I pay taxes on my internet bill already. So those taxes are paying for the state's internet infrastructure. And before you whine at me about the roads that they use, because everybody loves flipping roads, I don't care because the shipping has gas tax involved and various other taxes on the actual shipping of goods over roads that pay specifically for roads. A sales tax doesn't cover those things. A sales tax covers in-state services because it's applied by the state. Those state services are not enjoyed, in, enjoyed by a company residing outside of these borders. So that's the problem with this. That's an inherent problem with all of this is that the use tax, which is the tax we're talking about, makes no logical sense. No matter how many messages you send me, it doesn't make sense. It's a bad argument. And yes, I get that it exists, but it's wrong to exist. Sorry for the rant. Let's go on. In two earlier cases, the court held that an out-of-state seller's liability to collect and remit tax to the consumer state depended on whether that seller had a physical presence in that state. But that mere shipment of goods into the consumer state following an order from a catalog did not satisfy the physical presence requirement. Of course not. The court granted Sorterari uh, here uh, to reconsider the scope and validity of the physical presence rule mandated by those cases. Like most states, 
South Dakota has a sales tax. It taxes retail sales and of goods and services in the state. Sellers are generally required to collect and remit this tax to the Department of Revenue. If for some reason the sales tax is not remitted by the seller, then in-state consumers are separately responsible for paying a use tax at the same rate. Doesn't make sense. Why do we let our governments tax something that we purchase somewhere else and use in our state? It doesn't make sense. Many states employ this kind of complementary sales and use tax regime. <laughs> Maybe we need regime change. Regime change of the tax code. Get George Bush in here. <laughs> we can fix this. Under the court's decisions in Bellis, Hess, and Quill, South Dakota may not require businesses to collect its sales tax if the business lacks physical presence in the state. Without that physical presence, South Dakota instead must rely on its residents to pay the use tax owed on their purchases from out-of-state sellers. The impracticability of this collection from the multitude of individual purchasers is obvious. Yeah, because no one pays it. No one does. And consumer compliance rates are notoriously low. CEG, the GAO report to congressional, uh, congressional requesters, sales tax. States could gain revenue from expanded authority, but businesses are likely to experience compliance costs. Uh, <laughs> Do you hear that? <laughs> hear the title of that paper? Yes, compliance costs will be large. Uh, oh, it is estimated that Bellis, Bellis, Hess, and Quill caused the states to lose between 8 and $33 billion each year. No, they don't. They actually don't cause the states to lose that money. That shouldn't be the state's money. <laughs> and if we taxed retailers where the sale occurred... None of that money would be lost. Mm. Guys, I'm getting heated up. I'm getting angry. See sales taxes reported 1112, blah, blah, blah. In South Dakota alone, the Department of Revenue estimates revenue loss at 48 to $58 million annually. <laughs> uh, they're just going to waste it. Uh, particularly because South Dakota has no state income tax, it must put substantial reliance on its sales and use tax for the revenue necessary to fund essential services. Those taxes account for over 60% of its general fund. Really? Then I'm guessing they're overestimated. But, you know, maybe not. In 2016, South Dakota confronted the serious inequity Quill imposed by enacting uh, section 106, an act to provide for the collection of sales taxes from certain remote sellers to establish certain legislative findings and to declare an emergency. Legislature found that the inability to collect tax from remote sellers was seriously eroding the sales tax base and causing revenue losses and imminent harm. It's not a revenue loss if you never earned it. Through the loss of critical funding for state and local services. Legislature also declared an emergency. Whereas this act is necessary for the support of the state government and its existing public institutions, an emergency is hereby declared to exist. Fearing further erosion of the tax base, the legislature expressed its intention to apply South Dakota sales and use tax obligations to the limit of federal and state constitutional doctrines and noted the urgent need for this court to reconsider its precedents. To that end, the act requires out-of-state sellers to collect and remit sales tax as if the seller had a physical presence in the state. The act applies uh, only to sellers that, on an annual basis, deliver more than 100,000 of goods or services into the state or engage in 200 or more separate transactions for the delivery of goods or services into the state. Let me clarify something, guys. That's what the South Dakota one requires. That's not what all of them require, and that's not what the court ruled as a minimum standard, okay? The court will allow you to tax, uh, presumably, at whatever level, um, I haven't seen a level. I skimmed this case. I'm reading through it with you. Maybe we'll find one in here. I don't think so, which means that the South Dakota 100,000 thing, that's probably not going to stand for any state that enacts this. The act also forecloses the retroactive application of this requirement uh, and provides means for the act to be appropriately stayed until the constitutionality of the law has been clearly established. Respondents Wayfair Inc., Overstock.com Inc., and Newegg Inc. are merchants with no employees or real estate in South Dakota. 
Wayfair Inc. is a leading online retailer of home goods and furniture and had net revenues of over $4.7 billion last year. Overstock.com is one of the top online retailers in the United States, selling a wide variety of products from home goods and furniture to clothing and jewelry, and it had revenues of over $1.7 billion last year. Newegg Inc. is a major online retailer of consumer electronics in the United States. Each of these three companies ships its goods directly to purchasers throughout the United States, including South Dakota. Each easily meets the minimum sales or transaction requirements of the act, but none collects South Dakota sales tax. They don't have Amazon on there. Do you want to know why? Because Amazon does it. Amazon has done it, done it for a while without a law. Without a law telling it to do so, they just do it. Pursuant to the Act's provisions for expeditious judicial recovery, and but I'm just for a second, Amazon probably makes up the most of that lost revenue. Uh, and I wonder, I really wonder if the legislature might have just left out the Amazon revenue. Might have. I don't know. I don't know if they did. Or maybe they uh, maybe they did it before Amazon started. Maybe they did their study before Amazon started voluntarily taking it. I don't know that. But I just, uh, you know, you can always trust legislators, to be honest. Pursuant to the Act's provisions for expeditious judicial review, South Dakota filed a declaratory judgment action against respondents in state court seeking a declaration that the requirements of the act are valid and applicable to respondents and an injunction requiring respondents to register for licenses to collect and remit sales tax. Respondents moved for summary judgment, arguing that the act is unconstitutional. South Dakota conceded that the act cannot survive under the Bellis, Hess, and Quill, but, uh, under Bellis, Hess, and Quill, but asserted the importance, indeed the necessity, of asking this court to review those earlier decisions in light of current economic realities. The trial court granted summary judgment to respondents. <laughs> that means that the state lost at trial. South Dakota Supreme Court affirmed, meaning the state lost at the Supreme Court level. It stated, however persuasive the state's arguments on the merits of revising this issue, Quill has not been overruled and remains a controlling precedent on the issue of Commerce Clause limitations on interstate collection of sales and use taxes. This court granted cert. Because if there's something that the Supreme Court loves to do, it's to expand the freaking Commerce Clause and go ahead and legislate from the bench. Even though the Commerce Clause is the express purview of Congress. You... <sighs> Guys, I hate the Commerce Clause. More importantly, I hate how the Supreme Court treats it. The Constitution grants Congress the power to regulate con commerce. Congress. Congress. Not the courts, you dumb, fat idiots. Oh. Uh, to regulate commerce among the several states. Commerce Clause ref uh, reflects the central concern of the framers that was an immediate reason for calling the Constitutional Convention the conviction that in order to succeed, the new union would have to avoid the tendencies toward ec economic balkanization that had plagued relations among the colonies and later among the states under the Articles of Confederation because the colonies and the states under the Articles of Confederation were taxing goods from other states. Kennedy, you stupid, stupid man. I'm so glad you're retiring. Oh, you're using, <laughs> you're using the justification that the old states were taxing things from other states and that was bad to impose the requirement for states to tax goods from other states. How you miss this irony is beyond me, but maybe it's just because you're 3,000 years old. <sighs> Although the Commerce Clause is written as an affirmative grant of authority to Congress, to Congress, this court has long held that in some instances it imposes limitations on the state's absent congressional action, which is outside of your constitutional authority. If there was a Supreme Court, to a super Supreme Court to re regulate you imposed by Congress or the executive branch, they would find your actions here unconstitutional in all of these, all of these actions unconstitutional. Of course, when Congress exercises its power to regulate commerce by enacting legislation, this the legislation controls. But this court has observed that, quote, in general, Congress has left it to the courts to formulate the rules to preserve the free flow of interstate commerce. 
It did it because you overruled them in Wickard. Uh, or no, you didn't overrule them. Sorry. Sorry. You gave them free license to do whatever they wanted in Wickard. It's because when you dummies make the rules, you can just screw the American people over because you're not elected. And you can let Congress ride through the wave of anger that comes to you when you do it. To understand the issue presented in this case, it is instructive first to survey the general development of this court's Commerce Clause principles and then to review the application of those principles to state taxes. This will be great. From early in its history, a central function of this court has been to adjudicate disputes that require interpretation of the Commerce Clause in order to uh, determine its meaning, its reach, and the extent to which its limits, uh, it limits state regulations of commerce. This is Gibbons v. Ogden, 1824. Uh, Gibbons v. Ogden began the course uh, by defining the meaning of commerce. Chief Justice, Justice Marshall explained that commerce includes both the interchange of commodities and commercial intercourse. A concurring opinion further stated that Congress had the exclusive power to regulate commerce. A concurring opinion of the courts further stated that Congress had the exclusive power to regulate commerce. Had that latter submission prevailed and states been denied the power of concurrent regulation, history might have seen sweeping federal regulations at an early date that foreclosed the states from experimentation with laws and policies of their own, or on the other hand, proposals to re-examine Gibbon's broad definitions of commerce to accommodate the necessity of allowing states the power to enact laws to implement the political will of their people. Except that Congress could have passed a law that allows the states to do it. That was the other option that you left out, Kennedy. Just five years after Gibbons, however, in another opinion by Chief Justice Marshall, the court sustained what in substance was a state regulation of interstate commerce. In Wilson versus Blackbird Creek Marsh Company, the court allowed a state to dam and bank a stream that was part of an interstate water system, an action that likely would have been impermissible intrusion on the national power over commerce had it been the rule that only Congress could regulate in that uh, sphere. Thus, by implication at least, the court indicated that the power to regulate commerce in some circumstances was held by the states and Congress concurrently, even though it's not. And so both a broad interpretation of interstate commerce and the concurrent regulatory power of the states can be traced to Gibbons and Wilson. Over the next few decades, the court refined the doctrine to accommodate the necessary balance between state and federal power. In Cooley v. Board of Wardens, Port of Philadelphia from 1852, the court addressed local laws regulating river pilots who operated in interstate waters and guided many ships on interstate to foreign voyages. Uh, uh, yeah on interstate or foreign voyages. Court held that while Congress surely could regulate on this subject had it chosen to act, the state too could regulate. The court distinguished between those subjects that by their nature imperatively demand a single uniform rule operating equally on the commerce of the United States and those that demand the diversity which alone can meet local necessities. Through considerable uncertainties, or though considerable uncertainties were yet to be overcome, these precedents still lay groundwork for the analytical framework, uh, framework that now prevails for Commerce Clause cases. This court's doctrine has developed further with time. Modern precedents rest on two primary principles that mark the boundaries of a state's authority to regulate interstate commerce. First, state regulations may not discriminate against interstate commerce, and second, States may not impose undue burdens on interstate commerce. State laws that discriminate against interstate commerce face a virtually per se rule of invalidity. That's from Granhold versus Heald. Uh, state laws that regulate even-handedly to effectuate a legitimate lo local public interest will be upheld unless the burden imposed on such commerce is clearly excessive in relation to the putative local benefits. That's Pike versus Bruce Church and Southern Pacific although subject to exceptions and variations. And they give some more citations. These two principles guide the courts uh, in adjudicating cases challenging state laws under the Commerce Clause. But who decides what an undue burden is? Justices who don't own businesses. These principles also animate the court's Commerce Clause precedents addressing the validity of state taxes. The court interpret, uh, explained the now accepted framework for state taxation in Complete Auto Transit Incorporated versus Brady. Court held that a state, quote, 
may tax exclusively interstate commerce so long as the tax does not create any effect forbidden by the Commerce Clause. After all, quote, interstate commerce may be required to pay its fair share of state taxes. That's a bad decision. The court will sustain a tax so long as it, one, applies to an activity with a substantial ne nexus with the taxing state. But they're saying a substantial nexus is merely delivery of goods into that state. That's not a substantial nexus. That is a tangential nexus at best is fairly apportioned, which means it can't uh, tax one state over another. Does not discriminate against interstate commerce, same thing. Uh, so it doesn't favor in-state uh, in over interstate and is fairly related to the services the state provides. What services do the state provide to an online transaction? No one can answer that question. No one can. Before Complete Auto, the court had addressed a challenge to an Illinois sales tax that required out-of-state re retailers to collect and remit taxes on sales made to consumers who purchased goods for use within Illinois. The court held that a mail order company whose only connection with customers in the state is by common carrier or by U.S. mail lacked the requisite minimum contacts with the state required by both the Due Process Clause and the Commerce Clause. That's the correct ruling. They don't have... The state doesn't have authority over that other business. Unless the retailer maintained a physical presence such as retail out outlets, solicitors, or property within a state. So if you're sending a salesman to the state, that's different. And yes, that's how this is basic. This is basically how long arm statutes work in other jurisdictional questions. If you're sending an advertising into the state, if you're soliciting for business into the state, like you're like, you know what? We need those South Dakota dollars. We want to send a guy to South Dakota to sell our vacuum cleaner or whatever. Yes, yes, that actually probably satisfies the long arm statute and would allow you to haul them into court. That's a good way to determine if they should be paying sales tax. Retail outlets, solicitors, or property within a state. The state lacked the power to require that retailer to collect a local use tax. The dissent disagreed. There should be no doubt that this large-scale, systematic, continuous solicitation exploitation of the Illinois consumer market is a sufficient nexus to require Bellis has to collect from Illinois consumers and to remit the use tax. Uh, that's not a good decision. <laughs> Again, that's the dissent in, in Bellis Hess, and that was a terrible terrible dissent that's actually the right that's mm, that's the right decision if you ask me in 1992 the court re-examined the physical presence rule in quill that case presented a challenge to north dakota's attempt to require an out-of-state mail order house that is neither outlets nor sales representatives in the state to collect and pay a use tax on goods purchased for use within the state despite the fact that bellis has linked due process and commerce clause together Court and Quill overruled the due process holding, but not the Commerce Clause holding, and it thus reaffirmed the physical presence rule. The Court and Quill recognized that intervening precedents, specifically complete auto, might not dictate the same result were the issue to arise for the first time today. But nevertheless, the Quill majority concluded that the physical presence rule was necessary to prevent undue burdens on interstate commerce. It grounded the physical presence rule in complete auto's requirement that a tax have a substantial nexus with the activity being taxed. Yes, of course it should. The state, the state or the federal power to tax should always have a nexus with the actual thing they're taxing. Like why, why is this controversial for people? And why don't dummies on Reddit understand it? I don't get it. Three justices based their decision to uphold the physical presence rule on a star on stare decisis alone. Uh, that means that three of the justice based their decisions only on the fact that that's what the court decided before. But that's the rule. Stare decisis is the rule. Uh, let's see. Dissenting in relevant part, Justice White argued that there is no relationship between the physical presence slash nexus rule the court retains and the com and commerce clause considerations that allegedly justify it. But there's also no authority by the court to impose, uh, to 
create Commerce Clause rules uh, that Congress has not created. The physical presence rule has been the target of criticism over many years and from many, from many quarters. Correctly worded, from many state legislatures thirsty for more money. Quill, it has been said, was premised on assumptions that are unfounded and riddled with internal inconsistencies. Uh, that's from an article uh, written by Rothfield. Quill created an inefficient online sales tax loophole that gives out-of-state businesses advantage, an advantage. And while nexus rules are clearly necessary, the court should focus on rules that are appropriate to the 21st century, not the 19th. Terrible. Terrible. No, the court should not. Congress should. Each year, the physical presence rule becomes further removed from economic reality and results in significant revenue losses to the states. These critiques underscore that the physical presence rule, both as first formulated and as applied today, is an incorrect interpretation of the Commerce Clause. Quill is flawed on it. This is, again, Kennedy ranting. Quill is flawed on its own terms. First, the physical presence rule is not a necessary interpretation of the requirement that a state tax must be, quote, applied to an activity with a substantial nexus with the taxing state. Second, Quill creates rather than resolves market distortions. And third, Quill imposes a sort of arbitrary, formalistic distinction that the court's modern commerce clause precedents disavow. Except Kennedy doesn't run a business, so he's being fed this by states who don't run businesses to make the argument. Mm, this is... <sighs> All agree that South Dakota has the authority to tax these transactions. Again, I don't. I don't agree, but they mean all of the parties to this action. Uh, SB 106 applies to sales of tangible personal property products transferred electronically or services for delivery into South Dakota. It has long been long, long been settled that the sale of goods or services has a signif significant nexus to the state to which the sale is consummated to be treated as a local transaction taxable by the state. Now they're saying the consummation of the sale is upon delivery. I highly delivery of goods. I highly disagree. I highly disagree. I would say it's upon delivery of money that that is where the performance takes place. But, you know, that's just me. Uh, the central, dis because, especially because if they deliver goods to you and you don't deliver them money, they can recall the goods much easier than you can recall the money. Central dispute is whether South Dakota may require remote sellers to collect and remit the tax without some additional connection to that state. Court has previously stated that the imposition of the seller on the uh, of the duty to ensure collection of the tax from the purchaser does not violate the commerce clause. Okay. Mm, they're they're citing a case from 1940 when they're arguing about modern issues. This is the problem with the court. Okay? Justice Kennedy is saying, "Oh yeah, it's no burden on a seller to to have to collect a sales tax." That's one sales tax where the seller is located because this was in 1940. It's not 10,000 sales taxes that are available today. We'll talk about that when we get to Robert's dissent. But yes, there are 10,000 different taxing districts in the United States. Each one with its own rules. This is a huge burden. Huge burden for businesses. It is a familiar and sanctioned device that was, again, from 1960. This doesn't, it's not the same thing. Also, there were less sales taxes imposed in both of those years. There just must be a substantial nexus with the taxing state, but there isn't in an online transaction. This nexus requirement is closely related to the due process requirements that there be some definite link, some minimum connection between a state and the person, property, or transaction it seeks to tax. Again, a small retailer in Illinois. What is Minnesota's link to that retailer other than the fact that they may have mailed something with an address that goes to Minnesota and someone else brings it here? It is settled law that a business need not have a physical presence in a state to satisfy the demands of due process. 
although physical presence, quote, frequently will enhance a business's connection with the state, quote, it is inescapable. It is an inescapable fact of modern commercial life that a substantial amount of business is transaction transacted with no need for physical presence within the state in which business is conducted. Quill itself recognizes that, quote, the requirements of due process are met irrespective of a corporation's lack of physical presence in the taxing state. If you read Kennedy's opinions, here's what he likes to do. He likes to quote the, uh, something that he likes to quote from something that says the opposite of what he's uh, that he's ruling the opposite way, but he's quoting something to show, see, even this opposite thing says what we want it to say, right? He did the same thing in the uh, in the gay cake decision um, because he quoted Obergefell, which he wrote, which was, um, you know, the, the homosexual marriage uh, decision. He quoted that in his justification that the cake seller didn't have to in or well was mistreated watch that video for that explanation this is something kennedy likes to do he thinks it's a good argument it's it's not it's not at all actually when considering whether a state may levy a tax due process and commerce clause standards may not be identical or uh, coterminous but there are significant parallels the reasons given in quill for rejecting the physical presence rule for due process purposes apply as well to the question uh, whether physical presence is a requisite for an out-of-state out of seller's liability to remit sales taxes, physical presence is not necessary to create a substantial nexus. No, it's not. And no one argued that physical presence is necessary, but creating a substantial nexus is necessary to creating a substantial nexus. And never before has the court held that merely accepting a business transaction from a foreign state accepting and delivering a good to that state without soliciting there or without an ongoing business relationship never has a court ruled that, that was a substantial nexus until now this is a big decision and a bad one the quill majority expressed concern that without the physical presence rule a state tax might unduly burden interstate commerce it does by subjecting retailers to tax collecting obligations in thousands of different taxing jurisdictions yes but the administrative cost of compliance, especially in the modern economy with its internet technology, are largely unrelated to whether a company happens to have a physical presence in a state. For example, a business with one salesperson in each state must collect sales taxes in every jurisdiction in which goods are delivered. But a business with 500 salespersons in one central location and a website accessible in every state need not collect sales taxes on otherwise identical nationwide sales. No, and that's fine. Don't put... 50 people, one in each state. Don't do it that way if you don't want to pay the taxes. In other words, and, and again, good job creating a straw man. Like that, that's, that's Kennedy's argument is a complete straw man. Good job. In other words, under Quill, a small company with diverse physical presence might be equally or more burdened by compliance costs than a large remote seller. Yes, it would also be equally or more burdened by things like property taxes, payroll taxes. They're making that choice. They're consciously making the choice because they believe that the benefits of having a person in every state outweighs having a centralized sales force. They've already made that decision, Kennedy. In other words, under Quill, uh, a small company with diverse physical presence might be equally or more burdened by compliance costs than a large remote seller. Physical presence rule is a proxy is a poor proxy for the compliance costs faced by companies that do business in multiple states. Other aspects of the court's doctrines can better and more accurately address any potential burdens on interstate commerce, whether or not Quill's physical presence rule is satisfied. Except the, this isn't the court's job, though. The court has consistently explained that the Commerce Clause was designed to prevent states from engaging in economic discrimination so they would not divide into isolated, separable units. But it is, quote, not the purpose of the Commerce Clause to relieve those engaged in interstate commerce from their just share of the state tax burden. That's from Complete Auto. And it is certainly not the purpose of the Commerce Clause to permit the judiciary to create market distortions. 
If the Commerce Clause was intended to put business on an even playing field, the physical presence rule is hardly a way to achieve that goal. No, it absolutely is a way to achieve that goal because you're choosing to enter the forum. It's literally how the court has decided all of forum selection since International Shoe, since all of civil procedure developed. You dumb idiot. Mm. Quill puts both local business and many interstate businesses with physical presence at a competitive disadvantage relative to remote sellers. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. They're putting themselves at a disadvantage only because of their inability to innovate. If you can't compete with a physical presence over someone with a non-physical presence, then you're doing it wrong. If, cause if I might want to come in and try on a pair of shorts, or I might want to come look at what a TV looks like. Otherwise, everybody's going to be ordering Element TVs online because they're just cheaper than a Samsung. But the Samsung looks better, right? Like, that's the whole thing. You go into Best Buy and you look at the Samsung and you look at the Element TV and you go, oh my God, that thing looks like garbage. Even though it says it has the same specs or sometimes worse. <laughs> there are huge advantages to a physical presence that an online retailer doesn't have. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> this case makes me angry. Remote sellers can avoid the regulatory burdens of tax collection, can offer de facto lower prices caused by the widespread failure of consumers to pay tax on their own. This quote guarantees a competitive benefit to certain firms simply because of the organizational form they choose, while the rest of the court's jurisprudence, quote, is all about preventing discrimination between firms. In effect, Quill has come to serve as a judicially created tax shelter for businesses that, and notice he's quoting, sorry, I didn't read this, direct marketing. He's quoting from a concurring opinion here, not from the opinion of the court. In effect, Quill has come to serve as a judicially created check shelter for businesses that decide to limit their physical presence and still sell their goods and services to a state's consumers, something that has become easier and more prevalent as technology has advanced. Worse still, the rule produces an incentive to avoid physical presence in multiple states. No, it doesn't. Distortions caused by... The it's not an incentive to avoid physical presence at all, at all. It's a reduced cost, but that's not an incentive for most retailers. Ask Amazon, who puts the physical presence in basically every state because they can more efficiently deliver goods and services voluntarily. The physical presence rule is probably better for consumers all around, you dumb... Hmm. You robed idiot. Distortions caused by the desire businesses to avoid tax collection. Like, honestly, this is not their motivation. This is not the motivation of those businesses. You cannot convince me. Because putting up a... If Newegg wanted to put up a warehouse in another state, the, the tax collection in that state is the smallest concern on Newegg's radar. Right? Like... The multi-million dollar building, the multiple millions of dollars annually in staffing, the, the, the millions of dollars annually in state taxes that they have to pay, state compliance, orchestrating new contracts for, for their health care and stuff like that. I mean, we're talking huge, huge amounts of administrative overhead in setting up a physical presence. And you're laying it on the fact of tax collection. That's, that's the incentive. That's right. That's right, Kennedy. How many businesses have you opened, you stupid idiot? Mm. The market uh, mean that the market may currently lack storefronts. Who cares? Distribution points. Who cares? If you can distribute from one point and get everything there next day, who cares how many distribution points we have? That's a risk of the business, by the way, because if they congest their distribution point, if they can't efficiently manage their, their distribution flow, then their sales are going to suffer because people are going to know that they can't do it. And then what's going to happen? They're going to build another warehouse. 
Commerce Clause must not prefer interstate commerce only to the point where a merchant physically crosses state borders. Rejecting the physical presence rule is necessary to ensure that artificial competitive advantages are not created by this court's precedence. You literally created an artificial competitive advantage by doing this because now local retailers, local retailers have a competitive advantage over online retailers based on your rule. This court should not prevent states from collecting lawful taxes. They shouldn't be lawful, though, through a physical presence rule that can be satisfied only if there's an employee or a building in that state. The court's Commerce Clause juris jurisprudence has eschewed formalism for a sensitive case-by-case -case analysis of purpose and effect. Quill, in contrast, treats economically identical actors differently and for arbitrary reasons. They're not economically identical actors. They're not. I just said... Someone with a physical presence in the state versus someone who doesn't have it cannot, by their nature, be economically uh, identical. They have different compliance requirements for their HR. They have different compliance requirements for state law, for uh, workplace conditions, for health insurance, for just about everything. They're not economically identical. Consider, for example, two businesses that sell furniture online. Oh, gee. Well, yeah. If you create a straw man where you have uh, two, two that sell furniture online, nothing else different about them, right? The first stocks a few items of inventory in a small warehouse in North Sioux City, South Dakota. Second uses a major warehouse just across the border in South Sioux City, Nebraska. and maintains a sophisticated website with a virtual showroom accessible in every state, including South Dakota. By reason of its physical presence, the first business must collect and remit a tax on all of its sales to customers from South Dakota, even those sales that have nothing to do with the warehouse. Good. Maybe the first business should relocate to a different state, should uh, open up a virtual website, you know, a sophisticated website that they have to pay tens of thousands of dollars to, to create and upkeep. Um, they have to pay someone else to do it or they have to hire s staff like because probably the guy with the furniture store is usually not like an experienced webmaster. I'm just just. I'm, I'm painting in broad strokes, and I apologize to anyone who's generalized and offended by this. But under Quill, the second hypothetical seller cannot be subject to the same tax for the same sales of the same items made through a pervasive internet presence. No, that's right. They can't. This distinction simply makes no sense. Why? Why does it make no sense? So long as a state law avoids any effect forbidden by the Commerce Clause, courts should not rely on anachronistic formalisms to invalidate it. The basic principles of the court's Commerce Clause jurisprudence are grounded in functional marketplace dynamics, <laughs> and states can and should consider those realities in enacting and enforcing their tax laws. You know, you saying it, Kennedy, doesn't make it true. Mm. The Quill Court itself acknowledged that the physical presence rule is artificial at its edges. That was an understatement when Quill was decided and when day-to-day -day functions of marketing and distribution in the modern economy are considered. Guys, remember that Kennedy's modern economy ended in 1980. <laughs> like, that's... When, when was this... Let's see. Anthony Kennedy. Uh, let's see when his... Um, Anthony Kennedy was appointed to the Appeals Court in 1975, and he was appointed to the Supreme Court in 1988. This idiot hasn't seen a modern economy. Ever. Ever. This guy is 40 years removed from a modern economy. We've got to get rid of this Supreme Court. Like, the, the ancientness of justices is something that is not fit for dealing with some of these problems like anybody talking anytime one of these idiots mentions internet dust comes out of their mouth uh, mm. modern e-commerce does not align analytically with a test that relies on the sort of physical presence defining quill you want to know why it doesn't that's intentional they found a way based on what you guys had ruled to make business better in a footnote, Quill rejected the argument that, quote, title to a few floppy diskettes present in a state was sufficient to constitute a substantial nexus. 
And just a reminder, Anthony Kennedy was appointed to the appeals court, I think, before floppy disks were invented. Let that sink in. Let's see. Let's see. Floppy disks. Let's see. Wikipedia. When were these invented? Uh, history. Oh, the first ones, first commercial floppy disks developed in the late 1960s are eight inches in diameter. They became commercially available in 1971. It's an, what, an eight inch, eight inch floppy disk. Looked kind of like a record. Nineteen seventy six is the five and a quarter inch floppy disk. So literally, literally, this guy was appointed before the five and a quarter inch or, uh, consumer oriented floppy disks were cre were invented. I mean, just just think about that. Let that sink in. This guy is talking about modern e-commerce and he's been prohibited by professional responsibility standards from managing a business since 1975. He has no idea what any of this means. But it is not clear why a single employee or single warehouse should create a substantial nexus while physical aspects of pervasive modern technology should not. For example, a company with a website accessible in South Dakota may be said to have a physical presence in the state via the customer's computers. This guy, this guy, guys, this is the, this is what we're dealing with. You have a physical presence because someone accessed your website. Are you kidding me? A website may leave cookies saved to the computer's hard drives. Kennedy's wondering if he can eat cookies. I'm not even kidding. This guy has no idea what this technology means. Nothing. Or consumers may download the company's app onto their phones. Oh, my. Or a company may lease data storage that it is permanently or even occasionally located in South Dakota. Okay, that's physical presence if they're leasing data storage. If they're leasing real property in a state, that is the physical presence rule. What may have seemed like a clear, bright line test when Quill was written now threatens to compound the arbitrary consequences that should have been apparent from the outset. You're talking about arbitrary consequences and you're using completely arbitrary standards. The dramatic technological and social changes of our increasingly interconnected economy mo uh, mean that buyers are closer to ma most major retailers than ever before, regardless of how close or far the nearest storefront. Except they're not. They're not. Between targeted advertising and instant access to most consumers via any internet-enabled device, a business may be present in a state in a meaningful way uh, without that presence being physical in the traditional sense of the term. A virtual showroom can show far more inventory in far more detail and with greater opportunities for consumer and seller interaction than might be possible for local stores. Yes, Anthony Kennedy thinks it is easier to look at a virtual shirt than to try on the same shirt. That's honestly what he just said. Or to look at a virtual camera rather than pick it up and take a picture of the store and see what the detail looks like on the screen, physically in front of you. Instead of virtual, a virtual one is, is better. Hmm... Yet the continuous and pervasive virtual presence of retailers today is under Quill simply irrelevant. This court should not maintain a rule that ignores these substantial virtual connections to the state. The physical presence rule as defined and enforced in Bella Hess and Quill is not just a technical legal problem. Uh, it is an extraordinary imposition by the judiciary on state's authority <laughs> to collect taxes and perform critical public functions. No, not at all. 41 states, two territories in the District of Columbia now ask this court to reject the test formulated in Quill. Yeah, lot, of course. Of course they do. Of course they do. That doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Quill's physical presence rule intrudes on states' reasonable choices in enacting their tax systems. They're not reasonable. That's why the businesses are located in different states. They might not like your taxing structure. That's part of the whole point, Kennedy. 
and now that it allows remote sellers to escape an obligation to remit a lawful state tax is unfair and unjust. It is unfair and unjust to those competitors, both local and out of state, who must remit the tax to the consumers who pay the tax. And to the states that seek fair enforcement of the sales tax, a tax many states for many years have considered an indispensable source for raising revenue. I have an idea. Why don't you start just arresting all your citizens for tax evasion? Why don't they do that, Kennedy? Would it maybe look bad for the elective, elected officials to crack down on, uh, on use tax evasion? Would maybe voters be reminded that there's a use tax that they could actually overturn if they put different people in office? Why wouldn't they do it, Kennedy? In essence, respondents ask this court to retain a rule that allows their customers to escape payment of sales taxes. Uh, <laughs> Taxes that are essential. Actually, that's not. That's that's not what the rule allows them to do. The escaping payment of sales taxes is their own choice. Taxes that are essential to create and secure the active market they supply with goods and services. That's not true at all. An example may suffice. Wayfair offers to sell a vast selection of furnishings. Its advertising seeks to create an image of beautiful, peaceful homes, but it also says that one of the best things about buying through Wayfair is that we do not have to charge a tax. Charge sales tax. Brief for petitioner 55. Note, Wayfair doesn't say that. The state of South Dakota says that Wayfair hypothetically could create this marketing campaign that they didn't create. But Wayfair ignores in its subtle offer The petitioner is South Dakota, Kennedy. Wayfair is not doing that. South Dakota is creating that. I lost my spot just a second. Here we are. What Wayfair ignores in its subtle offer to assist in tax evasion is that creating a dream home assumes solvent state and local governments. No, it doesn't. State taxes fund the police and fire departments that protect the homes containing their customers' furniture and ensure goods are safely delivered. No. No, no. Mm -hmm. Your property tax, your property tax deals with your services like police and fire. That's your property tax, not the sales tax. Kennedy. that protect the homes containing their customers' furniture and ensure the goods are safely delivered, maintain the public roads and municipal services. Public roads are paid for by the gas tax in every state, Kennedy, that allow communication with and access to consumers. Nope, the municipal services, it's paid by your internet tax and your telecommunications tax and your cable tax and your phone tax, Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Support the sound local banking institutions to support credit transactions. No, no. Those are supported by taxes on the credit transactions. Like Minnesota has a mortgage, re, uh, a mortgage tax. When you get any mortgage or second mortgage, you pay a tax on it because that's supporting those institutions, Kennedy. Also, those local institutions pay property taxes. Uh, and courts to ensure collection of the purchase price. Yeah. Except you can't haul them into a Minnesota court. You'd have to haul them. You'd have to go to their forum. Mm-hmm. And help create the climate of consumer confidence that facilitates sales. According to respondents, it is unfair to stymie their tax-free solicitation of customers. But there is nothing unfair about requiring companies that avail themselves of the state's benefits to bear an equal share of the burden of tax collection. But they're not availing themselves of the state's benefits. And even if you make the argument that they are, the degree to which they are is so far less that it's ridiculous. Fairness dictates quite the opposite results. Helping respondents, uh, consumers evade a lawful tax unfairly shifts to those consumers who buy from their competitors with a physical presence that satisfies Quill, even one warehouse or one salesperson, an increased share of the taxes. Yes. Yes. Because they get a massively increased share of the public services by being located in that state physically. 
It is essential to public confidence in the tax system that the court avoid creating inequitable exceptions, but you, you create one here. This is also essential to the confidence placed in this court's Commerce Clause decisions, yet the physical presence rule undermines that necessary confidence by giving some online retailers an arbitrary advantage over the competitors who collect state sales taxes. In the name of, both feder uh, in the name of federalism and free markets, Quill does harm to both. The physical presence rule it defines has limited states' ability to seek long-term prosperity and has prevented market participants from competing on an even playing field. Uh, let's see. How many, how much longer is this? Goodness gracious, Kennedy. All right. I know this is getting long and I apologize, but there will be a, uh, there will be a companion video to this, a short form video in which I'm just going to scream at the camera a whole bunch. So that'll be fun. Section four, although we approach the reconsideration of our decisions with utmost caution, stare decisis is not an inexorable command. Alterations in, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Here, stare decisis can no longer support the court's prohibition of a valid exercise of state sovereign power <laughs> to tax something that happened somewhere else. That apparently is a state sovereign power now. If it becomes apparent that the court's Commerce Clause decisions prohibit the states from exercising their lawful sovereign powers in our federal system, the court should be vigilant in correcting the error. While it can be conceded that Congress has the authority to, engage, to change the physical presence rule, Congress cannot change the constitutional default rule. It is inconsistent with the court's proper role to ask Congress to address a false constitutional premise of this court's own creation. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It is proper to ask Congress, proper to ask Congress to deal with something that is within Congress's plenary power. It's called the political question doctrine, and you do it all the time. All right. Courts have acted as the front line of review in this limited sphere, and hence it is important that their principles be accurate and logical. But they're not here. Whether or not Congress can or will act in response, it is concurrently with the court and not Congress that is limiting the lawful prerogatives of the states. No, Congress, under the Commerce Clause, has to empower states to tax something that occurs somewhere else. That's the Commerce Clause. You're such... You're such a terrible justice sometimes. Further, the real-world implementation of Commerce Clause doctrines now makes it manifest that the physical presence rule as defined by Quill must give way to the give way to the far-reaching system and structural changes in the economy and many other societal dimensions caused by the cyber age. The cyber age, guys. And he quotes himself in direct marketing. Good job, Kennedy. I'm glad you quoted your own misunderstanding. Though Quill was wrong on its own terms when it was decided in 1992, since then the internet revolution has made its earlier error all the more egregious and harmful. Quill Court did not have before it the present realities of the interstate marketplace. In 1992, less than 2% of Americans had internet access. Yet, in 1992, they had the same problem. They had the exact same problem. You had the same thing. You had a bunch of states whining that they weren't collecting tax revenues. So even though it was so much different, it was literally the exact same. People have been, people have been ordering stuff since Wells Fargo was a wagon delivery company, guys. Like, that's how long this has been occurring. This is not new. People used to have to send off for things that took a long time to get here because there wasn't a retailer because we didn't have a highway system until the 50s. So before that, it was very inconvenient to have these multiple locations all over the place because there wasn't an effective distribution model. So people had to order things and wait like weeks for the Montgomery Ward catalog to come out and then they could order from that or the Sears Roebuck catalog. This is not new, Kennedy. Today that number is about 89% referring to internet access. 11% of Americans don't have internet access. Think about that. That's really terrifying. That's like 40 million people. 
When it decided Quill, the court could not have envisioned a world in which the world's largest retailer would be a remote seller. Why couldn't it? Why couldn't it do that? Actually, wasn't the world's re largest retailer prior to 1992 was not a not was a remote seller. Like Sears Roebuck became a thing because they delivered stuff. Montgomery Ward delivered stuff. I think service merchandise delivered stuff. These were massive companies. The internet's prevalence and power have changed the dynamics of the national economy. In 1992, mail order sales in the United States totaled 180 billion. Last year, e-commerce retail sales alone were estimated at 453.5 billion. That's it? That's honestly it? I would have, I would have suspected they were much higher. Like that's that's actually 180 billion to 400 mm, I'm going to do this. Let's see. Okay, if in 1992 I purchased an item for 180, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then in 20, what, 17 is the, uh, yeah, last year. Okay. <laughs> so there, so according to the inflation calculator, 180 billion or a hundred, oh, I, I got to add some zeros. Sorry. Calculate. So according to the inflation calculator, 180 billion in 1992 is 314 billion, 480 million in 2017, which means that they're really not outpacing inflation by all that much. Like that's, that's not actually that much growth, but you know, I don't know. Combined with traditional remote sellers, the total exceeds half a trillion dollars. Because <laughs> traditional remote sellers, by the way, are also falling off because most people don't order things from catalogs because they have the internet. Let's see. Okay, hold on. Uh, since the Department of Commerce first began tracking e commerce sales, those sales have increased tenfold from 0.8% to 8.9% of total retail sales in the United States. Compare Department of Commerce, U.S. Census Bureau, retail e-commerce sales in fourth quarter 2000. Oh, that's the citation. With the Census Bureau News quarterly retail e-commerce sales fourth quarter 2017. And it is likely that this percentage will increase. Yes, as it should. Last year, e-commerce grew at four times the rate of traditional retail and it shows no sign of any slower pace. Good. It's all around a better system. Guys, my blood pressure is going through the roof, I think. This expansion has also increased the revenue shortfall faced by states seeking to collect their sales and use taxes. No, they're increasing their revenue shortfall by increasing spending. Spending on money that they can't rely on coming in. In 1992, it was estimated that the states were losing between $694 million and $3 billion per year in sales tax revenue as a result of the physical presence rule. And now estimates range from $8 billion to $33 billion. The South Dakota legislature, and mind you, that's also because states have been increasing the tax rate from 1992 to 2017. So that's part of the accelerated amount of, of money that's coming out is the tax rates have gone up as well. So that's a little disingenuous to use that, but whatever. Who's 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 asking for genuine arguments? South Dakota legislature has declared an emergency. So, which again demonstrates urgency of overturning the physical presence rule. No, it doesn't. South Dakota's emergency should have no bearing on the court's decision. The argument, moreover, that the physical presence rule is clear and easy to apply is unsound. Except that it's clear and easy to apply. If you have a physical presence in the state, you're taxed, period. Attempts to apply the physical presence rule to online retail sales are proving unworkable. States are already confronting the complexities of defining physical presence in the cyber age. For example, Massachusetts proposed a regulation that would have defined physical presence to include making apps available to be downloaded in, by in-state residents and placing cookies on in-state residents' web browsers. Gee, 
okay, so they tried to make a non-physical presence into a physical one, and that's justifying the physical presence being unworkable? How about you own or lease property in the state? That's a physical presence. You put somebody in the state who's employed there, you have to pay payroll taxes, it's a physical presence. This isn't hard. They're trying to create alternative ways to get to physical presence and they're not working. That doesn't mean they're failing to find physical presence. It means they're failing to create physical presence where there isn't any. There's a big difference. Ohio recently adopted a similar standard. Some states have enacted so-called click-through nexus statutes, which define nexus to include out-of-state sailors that contract with in-state residents who refer customers for compensation. Okay, that's like a sales force in the state. That kind of makes sense. Others still, like Colorado, have imposed notice and reporting requirements on out-of-state retailers that fall just short of actually collecting or remitting the tax. Statutes of this sort are likely to embroil courts in technical and arbitrary disputes about what counts as physical presence. Oh man, we wouldn't want to <laughs> we wouldn't want to <laughs> embroil courts in technical and arbitrary disputes. That would just be silly. Reliance interests are a legitimate consideration when court weighs adherence to uh, when the court weighs adherence to an earlier but flawed precedent. But even on its own terms, a physical presence rule as defined by Quill is no longer a clear, easily applicable standard. Yeah, it's really hard to apply the are they located here or not physically question. <laughs> so arguments for reliance based on its clarity are misplaced. And importantly, stare decisis accommodates only legitimate reliance interests. Here, the tax distortion created by Quill exists in large part because consumers regularly fail to comply with lawful use taxes. They shouldn't be lawful taxes. That's part of the problem. Some remote retailers go so far as to advertise sales as tax-free. Oh, man. A business, quote, is in no position to found a constitutional right on the practice or practical opportunities for tax avoidance. Right, because the Constitution wasn't founded on tax avoidance, you idiots. Like, <laughs> the only the whole entirety of our country's founding was because of taxes. Only all of that. But we wouldn't want to found a constitutional right on the practical opportunities for tax avoidance. Literally the creation of the Constitution. Respondents argue that physical presence rule has permitted startups and small businesses to use the internet as a means to grow their companies and access a national market without exposing them to the daunting complexity and business development obstacles of nationwide sales tax collection. Right. Absolutely. These burdens may pose legitimate concerns in some instances. All. All instances. Particularly for small businesses that make a small volume of sales to customers in many states. Yes. Right. The... The parties with the least ability to comply with bureaucracy. Yeah, it would hurt them. State taxes differ, not only in the rate imposed, but also in the categories of goods that are taxed, and sometimes the relevant date of purchase. Eventually, software that is available at a reasonable cost may make it easier for small businesses to cope with these problems. Eventually, might. Eventually, might make it easier. Reasonable cost. <laughs> uh. Indeed, as the physical presence rule no longer controls, those systems may well become available in a short period of time, either from private providers or from state taxing agencies themselves. Because nothing is better than having 50, 50 different usernames and passwords for 50 different pieces of software written by 50 different more teams of morons with 50 different arbitrary requirements to help keep your account secure. Nothing is better than that. Nothing short. That's what I want. I want the state to create a website that they will have to justify a tax increase to fund and operate because they can't manage to do it cheap. Great job, Kennedy. Ugh. And in all events, Congress may legislate to address these problems if it deems it necessary and fit to do so. Man, Congress, federal Congress, pay attention. The court is telling you, 
You can pass a law preventing state ta states from enforcing this. That would be the best thing you could do. Oh my goodness, people would like Congress again. In this case, however, South Dakota affords small merchants a reasonable degree of protection. Sure, South Dakota does, but that's going to change. It's going to change. Why would they keep it? The law at issue requires a merchant to collect tax only if it does a considerable amount of business in the state. Law is not retroactive, and South Dakota is a party to the Streamlined Sales and Use Tax Agreement. Finally, other aspects of the court's Commerce Clause doctrine can protect against any undue burden on interstate commerce, taking into consideration small businesses, startups, uh, or... Sorry, or others who engage in commerce across state lines. For example, the United States argues that tax collection requirements should be analyzed under the balancing framework of Pike versus Bruce Church, Inc. Others have argued that retroactive liability risks a double tax burden in violation of the court's apportionment jurisprudence because it would make both the buyer and the seller legally liable for collecting or remitting the tax on a transaction intended to be taxed only once. Complex state tax systems could have the effect of discriminating against interstate commerce. Oh, man. Concerns that complex tax systems could be a burden on small business are answered in part by noting that, as discussed below, there are various plans already in place to simplify collection, and since in-state businesses pay the tax as well, the risk of discrimination against out-of-state sellers is avoided. And if some small businesses with only de minimis contacts seek relief from collection systems thought to be a burden, those entities may still do so under other theories. These issues are not before the court in the instant case, but their potential to arise in some later case cannot justify retaining the artificial anachronistic rule that deprives states of vast revenues from major businesses. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's what matters. It has nothing to do with anything other than states getting vast revenues from major businesses. For these reasons, the court concludes the physical presence of Quill is unsound and incorrect. The court's decisions in Quill Corp should be and are now overruled. In absence of Quill and Bellis Hess, the first prong of the complete auto test simply asks whether the tax applies to an activity with a substantial nexus with the taxing state. Such a nexus is established when a taxpayer or collector avails itself of the substantial privilege of carrying on business in that jurisdiction. Here the nexus is clearly sufficient based on both the economic and virtual contacts respondents have with the state. The act applies only to sellers that develop more than or deliver more than 100,000 of goods or services into South Dakota or engage in 200 or more separate transactions for the delivery of goods and services into the state on an annual basis. This quantity of business could not have occurred unless the seller availed itself of the substantial privilege of carrying on business in South Dakota. Yeah. <laughs> Except it doesn't. It doesn't carry on business in South Dakota. Business from South Dakota avails itself of its state's uh, protections and buys from it. Thus, the substantial nexus requirement of complete auto is satisfied in this case. Absolutely not. The question remains whether some other principle in the Courts Commerce Clause doctrine might invalidate the Act. Because the Quill physical presence rule was an obvious barrier to the Act's validity, these issues have not yet been litigated or briefed, and so the Court need not resolve them here. That said, South Dakota's tax system includes several features that appear designed to prevent discrimination against or undue burdens upon interstate commerce. First, the act applies a safe harbor to those who transact only limited businesses in South Dakota. Yes, this act does. Second, the act ensures that no obligation to remit the sales tax may be applied retroactively. Third, South Dakota is one of more than 20 states that have adopted the Streamlined Sales and Use Tax Agreement. This system standardizes taxes to reduce administrative and compliance costs. It requires a single state-level tax administration, uniform definitions of products and services, simplified tax rate structures, and other uniform rules. It also provides sellers access to sales tax administration software paid for by the state. Uh, sellers who choose to use such software are immune from audit liability. Any remaining claims regarding the application of the Commerce Clause and the absence of Quill and Bellis Haas may be addressed in the first instance on remand. Uh, the judgment of Supreme Court of South Dakota is vacated. This case is remanded for further proceedings not inconsistent with this opinion. There you have it, folks. I just can't... Uh... Huh. I just can't. I can't. I can't take it. I can't agree with this case. It's a bad, bad decision. It's a bad decision.
Mm. Oh, it's a bad decision. I don't know. Uh, I was going to go through Robert's Descent, but this video is an hour and 20 minutes long. Let's see, where is it? So Robert's Descent is here. It is one, two, three pages. Let's do it. Let's do it. And I am also going to record, if you're watching this and you haven't, there's also a companion video to this, which is a short one, probably of me just clawing my eyes out and screaming at the sky uh, because of how dumb this decision is. But uh, you can watch that one for a summary. You're, you're an hour and 20 minutes into this one. I'm guessing you're not needing a summary. <laughs> like to let be let known that there's a summary, but there is. There is. All right. In National Bellis Hess Incorporated versus Department of Revenue of Illinois. This is Chief Justice Roberts with whom Justice Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan joined dissenting. Three people I really have a strong distaste for. Uh, but they have made the right decision here, as has Roberts. It's a shame that uh, no one else on the court did. Okay, so in Bellis Haas, this court held that, oh, excuse me, under the Dormant Commerce Clause, the state could not require retailers without a physical presence in the state to collect taxes on the sale of goods to its residents. A quarter century later, in Quill Corporate, Corporation versus North Dakota, this court was invited to overrule Bellis Haas, but declined to do so. Another quarter century has passed, and another state now asks us to abandon the physical presence rule. I would decline that invitation as well. I agree that Bellis Hess was wrongly decided for many of the reasons given by the court. The court argues in favor of overturning the decision because, quote, the Internet's prevalence and power have changed the dynamics of the national economy. But that is the very reason I oppose discarding the physical presence rule. E-commerce has grown into a significant and vibrant part of our national economy against the backdrop of established rules, including the physical presence rule. Any alteration to those rules with the potential to disrupt the development of such a critical segment of the economy should be undertaken by Congress. The court should not act on this so important question of current pol uh, economic policy solely to expiate a mistake it made over 50 years ago. This court quote, does not un overturn its precedents lightly. Departing from the doctrine of stare decisis is an exceptional action demanding special justification. The bar is even higher in fields in which Congress exercises primary authority and can, if it wishes, override this court's decision with contrary legislation. In such cases, we have said that the burden borne by the party advocating the abandonment of an established precedent is greater than usual. That is, so even where the error is a matter of serious concern provided by correction, can, uh, provided correction can be had by legislation. We have applied this heightened form of stare decisis in the Dormant Commerce Clause context. Under our Dormant Commerce Clause precedence, when Congress has not yet legislated on a matter of interstate commerce, it is the province of the courts to formulate the rules. That's from Southern Pacific Company versus Arizona X. Rel. Sullivan. But because Congress has plenary power to regulate commerce among the states, it may at any time replace such judicial rules with legislation of its own. In Quill, the court emphasized that the decision to hew to the polit uh, physical presence rule on stare decisis grounds was made easier by the fact that the underlying issue is not only one that Congress may be better qualified to resolve, but also one that Congress has the ultimate power to resolve. Even assuming we had gone astray in Bellis Hess, the very fact of Congress's superior authority in the realm gave us pause and counseled withholding our hand. We postulated that the better part of both wisdom and valor may be to respect, oh, excuse me, respect the judgment of the other branches of government. The court thus left it to Congress to decide whether, when, and to what extent states may burden interstate mail order concerns with duty collect use taxes. This is neither the first nor second, but the third time this court has been asked whether a state may obligate sellers with no physical presence within its borders to collect taxes on, tax on sale to residents. Whatever salience the adage third times a charm has in daily life, it is a poor guide to Supreme Court decision making. If stare decisis applied with special force in Quill, it should be an even greater impediment to overruling precedent now, particularly since the court in Quill tossed the ball into Congress's court for acceptance or not as that branch elects. Congress should make this decision. That's what Roberts is saying. That's a true thing. Congress has the authority under the Constitution to do this. 
Congress has, in fact, been considering whether to alter the rule established in Bellis Hess for several for some time. See the addendum to brief uh, addendum to brief for four United States senators as well as Amicus Curiae one through four. Uh, brief for Rep. Bob Good Goodlatte uh, as Amicus Curiae. Three bills addressing the issue are currently pending. See Marketplace Fairness Act, Remote Transactions Parity Act, No Regulation Without Representation Act. Nothing in today's decision precludes Congress from uh, continuing to seek legislative solution. But by suddenly changing the ground rules, the court may have waylaid Congress's consideration of the issue. Armed with today's de decision, state officials can be expected to redirect their, er, their attention from working with Congress on a national solution to securing new tax revenue from remote sellers. The court proceeds with an inexplicable sense of urgency. It asserts that the passage of time is only increasing the need to take the extraordinary step of overruling Bellis, Hess, and Quill. Each year, quoting, each year the physical presence rule becomes further removed from economic reality and results in significant revenue losses to the state. The factual predicates for that assertion include a government accountability office estimate that under physical presence rule, states lose billions of dollars annually in tax revenue. But evidence in the same GAO report indicates that the pendulum is swinging in the opposite direction and has been for some time. State and local governments are already able to collect approximately 80% of the tax revenue that would be available if there were no physical presence rule. Among the top 100 internet retailers, that rate is between 87 and 96%. Uh, some companies, including the online behemoth Amazon, now voluntarily collect and remit sales tax in every state that assesses one, even those in which they have no physical presence. To the extent the physical presence rule is harming states, the harm is apparently receding with time. The court rests its decision to overrule Bellis Hess on the, quote, present realities of the interstate marketplace. As the court puts it, allowing remote sellers to escape remitting ta uh, lawful tax is unfair and unjust. Unfair and unjust to competitors who must remit the tax to the consumers who pay the tax and to the states that seek fair enforcement of the sales tax. But, quote, the present realities of the interstate marketplace include the possibility that the marketplace itself could be affected by abandoning the physical presence rule. The court's focus on unfairness and injustice does not appear to embrace consideration of that current public policy concern. No, it doesn't. Obviously. The court, for example, breezily disregards the cost that its decision will impose on retailers. Correctly calculating and remitting sales taxes on all e-commerce sales will likely prove baffling for many retailers. Over 10,000 jurisdictions levy sales taxes, each with different tax rates, different ta rules governing tax-exempt goods and services, different product category definitions, and different standards for determining whether an out-of-state seller has a substantial presence in the jurisdiction. A few examples. Listen to these. New Jersey knitters pay sales tax on yarn purchased for art projects, but not on yarn earmarked for sweaters. <laughs> Texas taxes sales on plain deodorant at 6.25%, but imposes no tax on deodorant with antiperspirant because it's hot. Illinois categorizes Twix and Snickers bars, chocolate and caramel confections usually displayed side by side in the candy aisle, as food and candy respectively, and taxes them differently because Twix has flour, so it's a food, not a candy. The burden will fall disproportionately on small businesses. One vitalizing effect of the internet has been connecting small, even micro businesses to potential buyers across the nation. People starting a business selling their embroidered pillowcases or carved decoys can offer their wares throughout the country, but probably not if they have to figure out the tax due on every sale. See Sales Tax Report 22, indicating that costs will likely increase for the most for businesses that do not have established legal teams, software systems, or outside counsel to assist with compliance-related questions. And the software said to facilitate compliance is still in its infancy, and its capabilities and expense are subject to debate. Uh, see the Etsy brief describing the inadequacies of such software. eBay brief saying the same. Sales taxes report 16 to 20, concluding that businesses will incur high compliance costs. The court's decision today will surely have the effect of dampening opportunities for commerce in a broad range of new markets. A good reason to leave these matters to Congress is that legislators may more directly consider the competing interests at stake. 
Unlike this court, Congress has the flexibility to address these questions in a wide variety of ways. As we have said in other dormant Commerce Clause cases, Congress has the capacity to investigate and analyze facts beyond anything the judiciary can match. Here, after investigation, Congress could reasonably decide that current trends might sufficiently expand tax revenues, obviating the need for an abrupt policy shift with potentially adverse consequences for e-commerce. Or Congress might decide that the benefit of allowing states to secure additional tax revenue outweigh any foreseeable harm to e-commerce. Or Congress might elect to accommodate those competing interests by, for example, allowing states to tax internet sales by remote retailers only if revenue from such sales exceeds some set amount per year. In any event, Congress can focus directly on current policy concerns rather than past legal mistakes. Congress can also provide a nuanced answer to the troubling question whether any change will have retroactive effect. An erroneous decision from this court may well have been an unintended factor contributing to the growth of e-commerce. The court is, of course, correct that the nation's economy has changed dramatically since the time that Bellis, Hess, and Quill roamed the earth. I fear the court today is compounding its past error by trying to fix it in a totally different era. The Constitution gives Congress the power to regulate commerce among the several states. I would let Congress decide whether to depart from the physical presence rule that has governed this area for half a century. I respectfully dissent. That is where I would put my decision, with the dissent. I mean, Kennedy's reasoning is bad. His understanding of the economy is bad. Just about everything Kennedy writes is wrong. And uh, we should not be supporting more taxes. But that's it, guys. You know, thanks for watching. We're at an hour and a half. Let me let me finish this up. Uh, this is a terrible decision by the Supreme Court. Online sales from small retailers should not be taxed. And not, not in the way that they're proposing. They should be taxed in the state where the money is going. That's where the sale occurs. That's where everything else happens. No state should be taxing you on use of something you bought somewhere else. And if you want some stupidity, look at a use tax. If you go purchase something in a different state and their tax is lower than yours, you have to pay the difference. That's the use tax. Why? Well, because you used it in our state, man. So, so what if you owned it and paid taxes on the transaction somewhere else? Who cares, buddy? You buy something in another state and bring it here, that's a use tax. Bought some beef jerky, driving across country, and you enter another state, you better stop and pay taxes in that state. Because you've got it there. Only if you eat it, I guess. Maybe if you don't eat it for two states. But whatever state you eat it in next, you might have to pay some taxes. You better check. You better check with the local municipality and make sure they haven't imposed a special tax on beef. I could rant on and on. I hate this decision. It's terrible. That's it. You guys have a good night.